Okay, let us continue with our discussion of the political and social history in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And I'd like to make a few key points, but really focus on the dissolution of the Northern Kingdom with its uh, um, invasion by the Assyrians and the exile of the 10 northern tribes and the importation of the Samaritans. We're going to explore those in a little more detail in subsequent videos. But for now, let's just have a look at a few key ideas. First of all, let's just look at something that's important for the 8th century and from the perspective of the outside of the Jewish world. We'll look at some of the Assyrian documents. And I, I want to go over the map with you in a few minutes. So don't panic if you're not exactly sure where is Assyria anyways. I wasn't either. We'll have a quick look at the map and I'll make things really clear. So in this uh, amazing uh, monolith, the Kirch monolith, with, which uh, celebrates the uh, achievements of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III, who will be very important for Israel, there is a discussion there of the Battle of Karkar, which was in 853 before the Common Era, and a few battles that were subsequent to that particular um, uh, conflict. Uh, this describes a period in which Shalmaneser um, participated in battles not in Israel, elsewhere in northern Syria for the most part, uh, against uh, a multi-state or multi-regional alliance of 12 kings. And what's especially interesting for our purposes, uh, this, this alliance was led by the the Hatti and the Sea Coast, which would have been Syria and, uh, of course, along the uh, Mediterranean coast, uh, listed among the 12 kings there is King Ahav, the Israelite, right? Remember Ahav, Ahab, uh, married to Jezebel, uh, was one of the last kings of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel. Uh, and he provides the largest single contribution of chariots, 2,000 of them, and 10,000 troops, which puts him right up there with the biggest contributions to this war effort, which I think is fascinating because it gives you a picture of what's going on really in the northern kingdom. Now, contrasted to the southern kingdom and Judah, they had a lot of internal problems. Remember, this is the rebel state. They broke away from Judah over issues of taxation and over issues of, uh, you know, how they were being represented, so to speak, to use kind of an American motif. I'm recording this, by the way, while they're still trying to figure out who won the 2020 election. Um, the uh, the northern kingdom had quite a bit of tumult in the ninth century, especially when compared to the southern kingdom. Uh, unlike the south, they did not have the same degree of attachment to the idea of a Davidic rule through the tribe of Judah. Obviously, the southern kingdom was ruled by Judah, and uh, they had ongoing conflict Judah over the bordering territory of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, sometimes they would ally themselves with the south, sometimes they would actually fight with the south. There's a lot of things going on. They also have turnover of the dynasties, as in many cases generals were heavily involved. The, the northern Israel army was quite powerful, and from time to time the leaders of the army ended up taking over the uh, leadership of the entire region. So there's a lot of internal you know, disruption going on in Israel itself during the 200 years that we're describing now between the middle of the 10th century when the kingdom split until the end of the 8th century when the kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrian invasion. Uh, but even in the midst of this tumult, you can see that the northern kingdom of Israel is a player regionally at this point. They are getting involved in larger geopolitical conflicts. They are making big alliances like King Solomon made. Uh, they are engaged in, uh, you know, far off conflicts, which is gives you some kind of picture of what the northern kingdom of Israel was like within the larger context. Here's an interesting find which points to the instability of the 9th century in Israel, uh, discovered by Naama Yahalom Mack, shown here, is this fascinating figurine. It was just discovered a few years ago here, and the crown around his head there indicates he's clearly of royalty, very beautifully preserved, little five-centimeter figurine. Now, the, the big question is, though, he's clearly a king, which king is he? 
So just looking at this period alone, it's possible that he could be an Israelite king. This was discovered in the northern part of Israel, which had fallen under sway of the Syrians in Aram. I'll show you a map in just a second. It could have been one of the kings of the kingdom of Israel, uh, as mentioned in the Kurch Obelisk, could have been Ahab. It could have been his son Yehu, who mounted a uh, ill-fated rebellion. Um, it could have been one of the kings of Aram that had invaded Israel in as they, the regional uh, treaties between the various 12 kings began to break apart. It could have been Ben-Hadad or Hazael, which uh, were the uh, the foreign kings that, that ended up dominating the northern part of Israel. Or it could have been a king of Tyre, perhaps Itobal. Uh, all of these are possibilities, and it gives you a sense of what kind of chaos was going on in Israel with tremendous dynastic upheaval and regional conflict and foreign invasion and so on. Okay, I've kept you waiting long enough. Let's have a look at the map and try to sort these things out. I'm going to focus on the invasion of 720 from the Assyrians, uh, and we will follow up with some detailed discussions in the next two videos. Uh, but I want to give you a sense not only of that, but also of its relationship to the Babylonian invasion that would occur um, another couple hundred years later. So here's our heroes in Jerusalem and Samaria, the uh, kingdom of Judah, of course, in the south, uh, with its capital at Jerusalem. And we will return, of course, to have a much longer discussion of Jerusalem and Judah in uh, subsequent videos. And then in the north, with the capital in Samaria, uh, you have the kingdom of Israel. Now, to their north is a larger regional kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Aram. Uh, at times in alliance with either Israel or even with Judah, uh, and at times hostile. And in fact, in the period that we're describing now, this is when Aram would invade the kingdom of Israel and dominate it significantly. But further north, and remember this northern trend is all following the Fertile Crescent, so it kind of curves around a, a, a an open-ended hairpin turn and then begins to go to the south following the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, you have the kingdom of Assyria with its base in the very old city of Nineveh, famous from the book of Jonah. And ultimately, Aram would get into trouble with Assyria and would be conquered by Assyria. Are you getting the image now of kind of like the little fish is eaten by the bigger fish, is eaten by the still bigger fish, and so on? If you aren't, think about that, because that's exactly what's going to happen here. Aram will swallow up northern Israel, and then Assyria will end up swallowing up Aram, and with it, northern Israel. And then the biggest fish which we're going to come back to in a few lectures from now, is, of course, Babylonia. The Babylonian Empire, uh, centered in the city known as Babylon, would eventually take over Assyria, which had taken over Aram, which had taken over northern Israel. And they would have huge consequences for the, the history of the Jews. Let us also mention, however, with the Assyrian invasion, there are two really important population transfers. That's kind of a neutral term. From the perspective of Israel, uh, this is the exile of the 10 northern tribes that we're going to talk about in the very next video. I've said that so many times this video, but you get the idea. All these things are, are all happening at the same time. Uh, according to the biblical account and from some fascinating non-biblical sources, uh, the Jews from the northern region of Israel and it's not the entire population, as we've mentioned a couple of times. It is several tens of thousands and particular segments of the socioeconomic profile of the Kingdom of Israel. They are exiled to places like Gozan, the river Chabor, the capital region in Nineveh, and then further to the east to the region of the Medes. Uh, these are all uh, where we know that the the ten tribes, or the representatives of the ten tribes, were exiled too, and we'll follow those up in the very next video. At the same time, part of the Assyrian strategy for dominating their conquered regions, which we see in, in other parts of their history as well, is not only to remove the local leadership, the elite that could potentially organize 
a, uh, a rebellion, but to bring into the region a foreign population that destabilizes a lot of the local relationships and alliance and so on. And this would be the population known as the Samaritans, uh, who probably come from the region called Kuta. There are some questions about their origins, but Kuta is uh, where, uh, according to the dominant opinion, the Assyrians took their local population, conquered from the south, and forcibly shipped them to Israel to center around Samaria. Uh, in fact, in Talmudic Aramaic, the Samaritans are typically called Kutim, which is plural for Kuthites, people who come from this region. Okay, so that's what's going to happen after 720. Um, we're going to pick it up by looking at the story of those yellow arrows in the next video. Uh, what happened to the 10 lost tribes? Thank you very much for watching.